I have a goal for this curl up, and that is to manage to record the entire screen this year. <coughs> Who knows? Might work. Um, I just wanted to give you a little uh, overview of the uh, curl since uh, last year, basically, where, how it looks in 2019. <coughs> so I've gathered a, a bunch of data graphs and stats and things from the project. Um, and most of them are actually from 2010 or, and later because I figured it, it represents sort of the modern curl and also we switched, to, we switched to Git in 2010. So before 2010, the data is also uh, less accurate. In, okay, number of lines of product code. It, checking in the source lib and include directory. It has doubled basically since 2010. Um, so, so the graph is continuously growing and growing and growing. And uh, someone asked me, or rather, uh, I probably shouldn't mention his name, but he said 160k for curl. What is it doing, really? So, is 160k lines of code? Is that a lot, or is it a little? I don't know. Is, I mean, what is a lot of code? I don't. I don't personally think it's What's a lot the of code. Binary size so, sorry. What's the compiled binary size of the library? Oh, uh, yeah, the compiled size, it's really difficult to say, right? On, on an x86-64, uh, on, on, on a regular Debian installation, the installed libcurl is 560k, I believe. Uh, I don't know what it tells us. Uh, the on library the tool? No, that's the library only. Okay. But that's x86, it's, uh, and 64 is the really big instructions. Uh, on, on, an ARM, on, an ARM 60, on an ARM 32 bit, the libcurl uh, on the same Debian installation is 60% of the size. So, it's, so, is that big or not? I don't know. So, we installed a 460k for iOS 64 bit. 460. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, if they got to the moon with it, <laughs> what have we accomplished? <laughs> but I, I, I would say that we have a lot of uh, different backends that aren't used at the same time, right? So we have these a dozen DLS backends. It's not actually a dozen different source codes, but still. And we have, nowadays we have two SSH backends and we have three resolver backends. So there's a lot of uh, different things that we switch on and off. So there are. I don't know exactly how much code one single build actually uses, but no build actually uses 160k. And we do have a lot of features. I mean, as in, we have 267 set-opt options. <laughs> it's, no, it's an insane amount, and I guess very few of us actually can mention the majority of them. Uh, and it, it is really most, more portable than most, so we have a lot of code just to handle all the different systems. Um, and nowadays, also up to date on Amiga, right? That's good. And just the other day, uh, just yesterday, someone posted in the IRC channel he built cur the modern curl on a, on a 486SX or whatever it was. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it still builds on, on a lot of different machines. And it is actually 25% comments. So out of these 160K, there are a lot of comments. So as I think we're down to 105 or something if we exclude the comment lines. Um, so I guess it's also a matter of how do you count the number of lines. And of course, we do this in C, always a fun, I always get a, a number of uh, interesting suggestions that we shouldn't do things in C and you know, it's insecure and we should rewrite it in something else. But it's really efficient and portable and very few other uh, non-C competitors can even come close to this. Of course we could avoid security problems, some would say, a lot of security problems by using something else, possibly, but using something else would make something else. Uh, I, I would say, and uh, uh, users would also suggest this to us, that part of our success and part of why we have curlies everywhere is because it's 
uh, in C, easy to port and run wherever you want to run them, run it. So we try to then mitigate the problems with C or efficiently the, by making sure that we do good code, of course. Possibly we succeed, possibly we don't, I don't know. Uh, on coverity, <laughs> uh, when we run static code analysis, the history of fixed defects looks like this. Being. It took a long time until we actually started to fix them. And then, since then we have uh, at least have the number of uh, defects down to zero most of the time. We do, and most of these uh, detected defects are actually in, uh, I mean, we detect them before we release them with, with coverage at least. So I don't think we've released any particular problem that coverage has found in a release in a very long time. So our, our question, we should assume there are unit tests verifying all those fixes as well, right? Uh, you can assume that, but it's, uh, in most cases we have unit tests verifying the fixes as well. But I, uh, So I, I wouldn't say that it is 100%, I don't think it's even 90%, but I, I, I think it's more than 50% of the cases we actually, nowadays we're pretty good at f uh, accompanying fixes with tests. But sometimes it's so hard to do the tests, so sometimes they lag behind. Uh, so the same test from Coverity with another graph is just like this, <laughs> which I think is fun because it just shows that we test with Coverity a lot of times and it usually just comes up with zero, which I think is a good sign at least. Coverity, we're pretty much at the end of the line with Coverity and static analysis in general because static analysis only takes us this far. We're pretty good now. So it, it finds stupid mistakes that we still get in, but we can find them easy and early and we fix them. Uh, so of course then going from static analysis we go into fuzzing of course and uh, last year Max Diamond explained a little bit of the fuzz, uh, fuzz project and, and how we got curl in there and if, you look, if we look at reports Fuzzing problem reported by OSS Fuzz over time has really pained out. As you can see, since September last year, I think there, were, there was this uh, peak in December. Well, it looks like a peak, but I think it was all one problem. It was just detected by OSS Fuzz a, a different number of different entry points into the same fix. So, yeah, that was a stupid mistake, um, and but. Really, OSS fuzz is not. I mean, the, it's still crunching. It's non-stop trying to find bugs in curl and hasn't found any particular uh, ones in a long time. So clearly, we're a little bit at the end of the line OSS fuzz-wise. But uh, and that's not because of we being this great. It's because we we need more uh, entry points in the library now to fuzz more more parts of the code. We're right, right now, we're apparently tested the areas we have good enough, we won't find much new. It's still good to keep on running this because it, it, it catches regressions as well, so it looks fine. And uh, going, um, if we look at the number of test cases, I think that's a fun, go, goes with your question basically. How many test cases do we have in the curl project over time? We have quite a lot of test cases and a number of test cases is also vague measurement, right? But one test in our system can actually do a very small thing or a lot of things. So it's, it's a vague measurement. But we at least have way over 1,200 tests now. And I did this fun, how do we, number of tests as compared to source code. Number of lines of code and the number of test cases. <coughs> And the blue line here is the number of test cases, and the red is number of lines of code. So at least the number of tests is catching up with, so sort of, it grows faster than we add code, which is, I guess, is uh, some measurement of, of good at least. Or put in another way, then, how number of source lines per test file since 2010 is going down, which I think is good. It means that we actually keep on adding more tests than we add code. Um, not to a really ter I mean, as you can see, the, the speed isn't really, it doesn't really shrink very fast, but at least in the, it goes in the right direction. We have a lot of tests. Um, 
So then it, it comes back to so what do we test? Test coverage on our tests. What, what parts of the code do, don't we test? And of course, you all know that it's, it's really hard to measure. What is test coverage? Especially then, yeah, we have, we support 12 TLS backends, two SSH backends, three resolver backends. We run on, uh, I don't know how many different hardware architectures and other build combinations. So what, what's the test coverage here? We run these coveralls.io measurements and it's really a shaky measurement. <laughs> Just on this service alone, it's really flaky. So, you know, the numbers go up from 72 to 78 or sometimes it claims we're down to 56 and sometimes it, uh, it's insane. So maybe somewhere in that range on one, using one particular TLS backend and one particular SSH backend at least. So I don't know. It's hard to measure, but we're testing a lot of code at least. I would say that uh, coveralls itself, they, I think they give a green badge if you're above 80%, so we're still sort of on the orange one, which they then say is less good. I don't know. <clears throat> Some of these tests that we actually have, we could run to increase coverage they're just so slow, so they're impossible for us to run on Travis. Basically, because they, because they do these torture tests, and the torture tests, especially on the FTP uh, connections, they're awfully slow, even, even on the fastest machines. So we don't do them. They could increase the coverage numbers. But, uh, right. So, then changes. My share of curl commits since 2010 has decreased from almost 70, well, about 70%, and I'm now at about, uh, slightly above, well, I'm, it's below 60%. So my share of commits is shrinking over time, which I think is a good trend. I don't need to do the majority of the commits, even if I actually still do. Um, and uh, then that's my share. The number of commits per release since 2010 Pretty much, it goes up and down. This is a, the, the little trend line in there shows that we're actually doing slightly less, uh, slightly fewer commits per, per release. I'm not sure it signifies anything. I think actually over previously, before we had a proper CI system, I think we did more commits that we then later had fix up commits to fix because we ruined something in the earlier commit. Nowadays, I think we have better commits because we test them in CIs first. So I think while the number of commits may be lower, I think the commits are more higher quality. Hard to measure, but I think so. So distributed per year, we can see that um, we're basically, I don't know, some ups and downs, but roughly the same. Over the years, we, we, have, uh, we had some, some of the earlier years, I had even more commits, but it has basically remained like this for a long time. So we're, we're keep, keeping up that uh, number. I have another fun graph separating num co number of commit authors in curl per month since 2010. Bam. Uh, the, the red here, the red graph is number of commit different commit authors per month. So we can see that we're slowly increasing the number of commit authors all the time. And the blue one is number of first time committers in the project that for that month. So we can also see that we have a pretty large number of first time committers every month. It's act I think it's fun that out of all these months since 2010, it's only one month that we didn't have a first time committer. And that's like, you know, February 2010. Zero. Every other month since then, we've had at least one person who, who wrote a, a patch for the first time in the code project. Which I think is, I think it's cool that we can maintain that trend and it's, the blue line is still fairly high up. It means a lot of people are doing things for the first time every month, basically. And the green then being the, the total number of commit authors in, in Git keeps going up. So I think that's a nice trend. It means that we're at least open enough, friendly enough to uh, welcome people to do things. And, and we 
managed to do. If we exclude all the first time commuters from, from, the, from the graph, basically looking at how, man, how many of us are actually contributing code per month to the core project, it is also slight, slowly increasing over time. So yeah, nowadays we're roughly 10, 10 people committing code every month or so. It's a, as you can see, it's a very up and down. Uh, a lot of us are not doing this uh, full time every month. We're all coming and going, but enough, enough of us are spending time to make sure that we're, we're getting things done and a lot of people are, are around all the time. So as I said, my share of commits since forever, which um, this is since basically late 99. Uh, I'm just showing this because I want to show you another graph uh, later uh, after this. So uh, my share of all commits is hysterically big than the rest and then there's, there's the top. These are the top 10 committers. So as you can see, um, on this list we have a few people who have left the project since a long time. Young and um, Ginter, they're gone since a while ago. And some others, like Steve, hasn't committed in a while, but he's still there in the top. Uh, and uh, a few others. And looking at it since 2017 instead, uh, I'm still number one, but we can see that uh, a lot of the others have rearranged itself. But I think it's good that we have, there's a, still a steady stream of commuters being there. Marcel there hit number two. Um, I think it's good. I, uh, I know that uh, during my, uh, uh, this, this presentation, my last two years, I've been annoyed by a little thing in this graph. Days between current releases, because we had this, uh, you know, number of days since releases, we did this number of patch releases several times. When, when I messed up, someone messed up, we had to do a patch release just the day after a release or just a few days after the previous release. And that made this graph this sawtooth-like because some normal release, very quick release. Normal release, very quick release. Normal release, very quick release. And that's, uh, that was always, and it still is, a sign of something wrong in the project. What? Why don't we figure out the problems before we release something? Why do we have to do patch releases? And at least now we can see that we have not had a patch release, one of those uh, stress out the fix in a while. I'm not sure we actually changed anything to, to, I'm not sure I can say that we have managed to become better, but it, it looks better in the graph at least, so I'm, I'm happy. I hate those, uh, you know, I, I do release in the morning and sit back, ah, that's great, and then just hours later someone comes back with a bug report and I'm all up in arms about, hey, it doesn't work anymore, and I have to, Yes, I, I think the number of CI builds is a good explanation as to why. And, and I mean, we're, we're doing better and better commits all the time, so we actually introduce fewer and fewer mistakes, I think, now, over time. So yeah, I think that is a big contributing factor. The number of CI, our CI system is basically just one and a half years, two years old, really. So I think maybe over time we'll see that the introduction of the CI system is somewhere around there that made, made it possible for us to avoid a lot of these mistakes. And also, since I count, uh, right, yeah, exactly. Um, the average uh, interval between releases is 50 days, and the median is 56, and I think 56 is fun, because 56 is exactly the, num the interval that I aim for, right? That's seven, eight weeks. So it is exactly the median, that's exactly where I want to be. So the maximum is 83. I don't know exactly <coughs> why we went so far. That I don't remember exactly, but it was over the summer, so I think it was I was away or whatever it was. And the minimum is two, and but we have several of those patch release things. Um, so bug fixes per release, also a fun stat. It's it's clearly increasing. I don't know if we're actually being better at fixing bugs or if we're better at recording bugs or better at, at uh, 
tagging them in the release notes. We at least fix a lot of bugs. And a crazy amount of bugs, really. How many bugs can you have with 160k line, lines of code? How do you count bugs? I'm very liberal in counting bugs. So I'm counting a lot of things as bugs. Yes, so, so when, I, when I add a bug to the release notes, I basically go through commits since the last time I, I updated the list, and I say, is this commit a bug fix or not? And most commits are bug fixes. So, so and I, I count bug fixes that fixes something that was in a release. So I don't, fi I don't count bug fix to something that fixed the commit, like from yesterday. Uh, uh, if it wasn't in a release, it's not a bug fix. If we fix a mistake in a release, it is a bug fix. So it's, uh, it's not, I mean, it's not exact science. So uh, uh, a fix, uh, updating the documentation is also a bug fix. Uh, adding things to Travis is usually also counted as a bug fix. So I'm, I'm very liberal. Bug fixes can be a lot of things. So if we split that data on bug fixes per day, we can also see that we are actually doing a lot. Since this is more than not per release, this is split out over time. We can see that uh, over time we're, we're doing more bug fixes than before. So does this, how does this then turn out in, in vulnerability reports since 2010? And what, what's interesting is that before 2010, we basically didn't have any vulnerability reports at all, which of course didn't mean that we were better than, it just mean that nobody looked for them. So then something happened and <coughs> people started looking. And <laughs> they found a lot of problems. So yeah, last year we had the exact same amount of vulnerability reports as we did the year before. So um, we're not really improving in, uh, in vulnerability problems. It's really, I, I don't have any good explanation as to why or, I mean, most of these bugs are also very old. So they're not introduced like the last year or so. They're mostly introduced many years ago. So I don't know. It, I, I think it's interesting that people keep finding very old bugs because why do they find them now and why didn't they find them last year when they were also looking at them? I think it's interesting. I don't have any good answers. But uh, 12 issues last year. We're at three this year. I guess we're going to end up somewhere in the same. Well, when did the housing come out? Yeah, 2017. We, 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 became part of there was as fast but um, th these are usually not found by OSS fuss OSS fuss I think have has found like four yeah, okay um, that's true but uh, when you implement a browser in the library like, like you did on the external project yeah, right for fuzzing girl yeah um, when you started it all then maybe it wasn't time when became more widespread. Yeah, that is true. And people found all bugs. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think in general, if you're looking at this trend, somewhere around 2013, 2014, that's when people started doing fussing in general. So I think that fussing as a concept is a big explanation why they started finding more problems. As a fussing turned out to be an excellent tool to find mistakes because Static analysis just takes us this far, and then fuzzing is the next level. So I think that is a good explanation. The, the big one, 2016, is uh, we had a security audit done by an external company. So that's actually a manual code review, and they found, what was it, nine or 11 different issues just by reading codes. Uh, but yes, a lot of people, but uh, I think most of these bug report, most of these vulnerabilities, they are found, found by people using fuzzing but not using OSS fuzzing. They basically run their own fuzzers their own way. We have, I know that we have uh, these uh, repeat reporters that come back, oh, it's me again. I run this sort of thing with my fuzzer and now it says this. So clearly, clearly there's, uh, there are many people out there doing this kind of stuff basically full time. So and if you look at it, uh, there are more and more types of fuzzers coming. 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, for example, I have just started to write a fuzz that that uh, well, randomly um, uh, returns no on an hour. Uh, an hour. So right. you can test code that you normally can't test because an hour will always succeed. But the, but that's that's the case that we already have covered in the in the t curl test suite. That's the torture test I was talking about. In curl in the curl test suite we have a torture test. It runs every test first and counts the number of malloc's and then it reruns the same test that number of times and fails malloc one two three four five six six seven and all the way through and make sure that they all nothing crashes never leaks memory and so on. And then uh, we've extended that so that they're not only malloc, so every, basically every dynamic function call can fail like that. That's what makes them really slow as well. So you can make, the, you can make socket calls fail and, and read the calls from the socket fail. So, so yeah, you can end up to a lot of calls so you can make one of those fail in the middle. It's very, it's also, making random malloc fail is an excellent way to make sure that your exit routes are actually working. Yeah, but um, there aren't that many of these bugs that anyone got paid for, actually. I, I think the number of bugs someone got money for is, um, is less than 10 in total. So um, I'm not sure what it would... Oh, well, uh, of, of course, uh, the, uh, the code audit they did, they got paid. So that's, that's true. Maybe 20 then in total, 20 of 87 got paid, something like that. And it's of course a good question if, um, if we would get more, if we pay more or better, or right now we don't pay at all. Uh, um, we have, have I don't, I'm, I'm sure we have more of those, but we have some excellent number of integer overflows. Um, I would say that's a great lesson from, I think we have more than five flaws that's just integer overflows wrapping us mallocking something then keeping the sum up the number and using that memory so we have a lot of that and of course we have really old flaws it doesn't matter that the code's been around forever people will find bugs in it um, i've had this uh, <laughs> argument with people sometimes you know, there's the, the EU project that's uh, sponsored. They have an EU bug bounty system now that you can, they have, uh, I don't remember how many million euros they pay for, I think there are 18 open source projects or so. And they have an excellent system where they pretty much pay for bug bounties to the one finding the bug. And then they have a bonus, 25% if you also fix the bug. And I've argued with them that it's stupid to have that bonus because nobody, whoever finds this bug, will actually fix the bug in, in, in the... Yeah, yeah, and if I would find it, right, but if I would find it in curl, yes, I would do it, but, but hardly ever is one of these reporters, we have had 87 CVEs so far, I don't think, I mean, well, two or three of them have, has been f fixed correctly by the reporter, right? It's mostly one of us who actually know the code. We can fix it. Once they point it out, then, ah, stupid. This is the correct fix. But for the, the reporters to actually fix it, it's, uh, they're, ex they're good at finding bugs. They're not as good as fixing bugs. It's a different part of right? And, and it takes a completely different uh, requirement of understanding the project, the architecture, what, where we're going, what's right or wrong in the project. It's, for them, it's easy to hammer on and find a crash somewhere and, and repeat it and say, okay, I can send it to a and we overflow here, but what's the correct fix? That's a completely different question. In the EU project, they just refuse to pay the money to someone else. So you have to be the reporter and fix the bug to get the bonus. So if you just report it, you get money. The one who fixes it, then if that's someone else, you get nothing. Make it you. Make it you. Make say, okay, here's the facts. Fix, you report it as yours, and give me, well, right. Yeah, right. You can do that, but that's, yeah, of course. But that's some kind of fraud. 
Uh, I, I'm, no, no, I'm, I'm, con I'm convinced that it will result in nobody will submit any fixes because you, it's not worth that 25% extra money because you will spend twice the time to, to write the fix that nobody will care about because you won't fix it the correct way. So you would rather just not do it, just report the problem, move on to the next problem. And I think that is the correct way because they're good at finding bugs, they're not the right person to fix it. Fuzzing is interesting. It's, under, it's an undirected search, fuzzing. I mean, as an implementator... Yeah, they can't even have it directed. Yeah. It's, 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 if I wanted to find bugs in my software, I'm pretty certain I could find them. Um, but I don't have the time to have an infinite amount of bugs <laughs> right. to, to find them. Uh, and that's kind of the other side. I mean, it'd be interesting if you were given enough time and effort, you know, how many vulnerabilities you would find just on your own. How you could make them. Right, <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, <laughs> I didn't actually answer, ask them the question. Well, what if, what if these, what prevents these projects from reporting their own flaws or yeah. creating them and yeah. reporting them? Okay. That good old uh, Dilbert. I'm going to write myself a new <laughs> mini <laughs> minivan. <laughs> Actually, Git is surprisingly bad at showing. Um, all right, bug bounties. I'm going to get, go come back to bug bounties. Uh, Git is surprisingly bad at, at showing. I wanted to see the num which files have been changed the most number of times since 2010, which is, uh, I don't know how, how visible this is, url.c and the openssl.c. Amusingly enough, imap.c, hp2.c, smtp.c, multi.c, pop3.c. So, pretty much the ones we would suspect. Uh, I, I, I was going to make a script that would do git blame on every file and then com count the number of commits each file consists of today and compare how many commits we have spent to produce them, right? You know, because most com most commits are gone already, right? They're overwritten by second commits. But Git is really bad at doing that because it, it, it considers a lot of changes to be renames from something else. So if, if I try to find, find files, uh, I didn't, it wasn't possible. I thought it was a great idea. But, uh, you use Reflog, didn't you? To find every change that's occurred. Yeah, but I can just uh, Git blame. Git blame and unique. Git blame commit hashes or in the left just unique that yeah, this file has 14 commits in it. And I can see that through history it's been 200 commits. But it didn't work out really well. I'll work on my scripts. Uh, it's uh, clear that a lot of files we're changing, we're, we are changing them very often and they're <laughs> clearly. I don't know. There's this project called, I don't remember what it's called even, uh, to try to find a heat map of a file, which files are changed the most and which functions in these files are changed most. Because if, if you're changing the same file and the same ch functions a lot, that's, uh, I mean, that's the reason why would do we do that? Because they're probably complicated or wrong or bad somehow, so we should refactor or fix or rewrite or whatever. <coughs> so, I guess this is also a signal that these files are either too big or too complicated or, or something. So uh, the annual user survey that, which, uh, that I try to put up uh, later every year, I just wanted to bring back some memories. <coughs> Since it's really hard to know what people are thinking, using, doing with curl since we don't uh, ever know really what people are doing and we don't know who's using it or what they do with it. So we ask people and <laughs> amusingly enough it's hard sometimes to trust what people are actually answering because do they really know? They just answer something? Uh, I'm just, uh, so I, how, how good are we to, to, to handle different things in the project? How good are we at security? giving credit, handling patches, bug reports, doing information, uh, dealing with newcomers, and uh, handling minorities. And yeah, everyone thinks we're pretty good in general. It's just the same mishmash. It's hard to tell anything. Yeah, is this, 
the trend is going up from last year. Maybe we're good, better. I don't know. Um, I think that the, our user survey also has the problem that it might be a completely new set of people that answered this year that then answered, answered last year. So it's really hard to base any, anything. The, the, this this year it was 600 something. I think I have some numbers later. So 600 something, but it was m I think it was much larger the year before. So I think we reached out to a slightly different audience, maybe. <laughs> so sample size is pretty large, but it doesn't say that there's an overlap with the year before. I actually had one of those questions: How did you answer this question last year? So just get a feeling for how, how big is the overlap really, but statistics is hard. I, I, I like this question just to figure out what, why are people using curl, what's good with curl, why, I mean, what's the reason for using curl and not something else. Um, and the interesting then, the quality of the products is, is the number one, which I of course think is fun, and as also, um, multi-platform being number two, which I think is good because I would put it up as one of the primary reasons too. Interesting enough, it says documentation, support of many protocols and the API, which is also interesting because if we look at what people then claim to be the worst parts of curl, it's basically the same. <laughs> so, so yeah, so so look at this slide then. The best parts of curl is claim documentation is number three, and the worst parts of curl is the the, the worst is documentation. Is there any subdivision of documentation? No, but it, but this question has like fourteen different answers. Your the the respondents are supposed to check the three worst or whatever it is, so, or the three best and the three worst. So documentation is very generic and wide, of course, and there are different users, users of the command line, users of it. Hmm. Do you include the examples? Do you consider examples part of the documentation? Well, I consider that, yeah, but they, they were not separated. So yeah, I consider the examples part of the documentation. Uh, I'm not sure what users think. I think in the worst part, I mean, it's mentioned the build environment, which isn't mentioned as a good part. So. Uh, and I, 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 and I, can, I can see why. I, interesting enough, then libcurl API number three here was also mentioned as number five in the good part. So. Welcoming to new users and contributors, of, apparently not here. Website, not as good. <laughs> Oh, but I, I find that curious because I don't really understand what people want from a website other than what we're already providing, so I don't know. Could you, uh, could you correlate that these, this might be a different cohort of people than the, what the people like? Could you identify, for example, if these were web developers or if they were C programmers or you know, some sort of generic? Yeah. Um, yeah. That might be a good question to add, to add some sort of dimension. But, but really, I think, in, in general, I think maybe this, this survey lacks my uh, skills with statistics and time to devote to actually separate out it properly to understand it better. So I, I tend to just put it all in one lump like this and try to understand it, and it's hard. <laughs> uh, you might find that if you put some just generic standard I said, you know, are you a user, are you a developer in this code and in this program that might help us. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good idea. So I'm going to do the user survey again uh, around May then. So yeah, I'm interested in feedback and if you have ideas of what to ask about and what to not ask about. Right, 670 last year. Um, I have the entire um, analysis and all the data over there. You can just Google for a survey 2018 curl and you'll find that it's a huge thing. I, I also find it interesting to just you know what protocols are people using, or which SSL uh, TLS backend is the most popular and so on.
everyone is using the PHP as the popular one is open as a server every year. <laughs> but the tail is interesting. Website traffic. We've changed to Fastly than, um, well, almost two years ago, I think. So everything is easier with Fastly. And I say that from, for many reasons, because not only does Fastly take away all the load from our, our main website, we don't have... <laughs> Uh, right, so we have now a, a, a immensely increased traffic to the website. I guess it's because it's much faster for everyone, so it's much more convenient. Uh, <coughs> less reason for people to use uh, mirrors and, and uh, other local solutions. 41 terabyte the last year. And, and uh, I don't have any logs, so I don't know what people are using. <laughs> No logging, no tracking. I don't have. Any, I, I know the number of. I know how much data they're downloading. I, I know the number of requests, and I can see that sort of divided per day. But I don't know what people are actually using on the website. Is that include Yeah, this is the entire site. So that's everything, and it's even including videos that we host. And I don't think many people are actually watching the videos. It's not. I think. I think the. I think it downloads that makes it quite a lot of data, but I also think that there's a quite a lot of um, documentation reading. From what I recall before we switched from Fastly, documentation and downloads, and a, a particularly a few man pages are the, the popular pages. So I could actually set up something that analyzes logs and everything from Fastly, but I haven't bothered because that's a lot of work. And, since it's a CDN, they have servers everywhere. I have to make some service that collects those, gets bombarded by logs from everywhere. And so, mm. I could also pay for a service from someone that offers that, but then I need to pay someone for it. So. I haven't really found a reason. Uh, Stack Overflow has, uh, while well, we're reaching 35,000 questions, tag curl, which is interesting because of course, questions tagged with curl are not always about curl. They are also often just using curl. And there are often tagged both curl and PHP, for example. So a lot of these curl questions are curl uh, in PHP. <laughs> that is basically unheard of. <laughs> I, but, but I think actually on, on Stack Overflow, I think it has a separate tag. So it's not the curl tag. I think they have a curl something else. So this is cur our curl, but it usually in combination with something else that makes it... Uh, I wouldn't say that it is uh, unrelated, but when people are talking about curl in PHP, for example, it's often how to use the PHP binding, which has, in many cases has their own solutions and things how to do that, that I don't think is uh, a clever way to do it, but they still do it, so... I think that's 80% of questions is questions. Yeah. Any questions I get almost invariably is this a question about curl? It's not. And, uh, and then you got to go figure out how someone's thinking in some other language about how they expose the curl. Right. So, looking over time, these are questions tagged as curl as a share of the total amount of questions asked on Stack Overflow. I like the fact that it's. 0.18 percent. <laughs> they have a lot of questions on Stack Overflow, but it's still at least it's basically basically the same amount of uh, the same share of of all of all the questions over time over the last like uh, ten years or maybe a little less. But it's amazing, and I'm not sure why then. But I, I guess uh, it's uh, some. This is a total amount of questions filed with curl as a tag, which then has shrunk recently. But I guess since it's still the same share of total, I guess that's because the total amount of questions has gone down on Stack Overflow. It could be uh, people using Stack Overflow less and less. Yeah, it looks like that. I didn't really analyze. I would just... Just to give another data point, we have stuff on Stack Overflow and we see the same thing. Yeah. I think there are less people using Right, that's why I wanted to correlate both these graphs, since th that one seems to indicate that we're remaining the same level in comparison to the others, while we're actually shrinking in, in frequency. So is it the same graph cumulative, or just 
Well, that's the, to that's the number of uh, questions per, per time period. So it's obviously there are now, a, 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 I mean, less frequently used tag of, uh, of the, on the same time. Maybe because the documentation was getting so good that just don't have to do But, but I will compensate by showing you another fun graph that I know Tim will appreciate as well. Google Trends, worldwide search over time, the last 15 years, how do you think Curl has done in comparison to other projects of similar style? I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I mean, I, I could, I can enter curl, and, and it actually sh sh uh, separates curl as a software project. I don't know how they separate curl from other curls, but it's actually, when I want to compare curl, it actually identifies it as curl software project. So it apparently uh, it knows something. So I could just pick that curl and not curl as in curly hair or whatever. I don't know how they do it or, or if they even do it. Curl is also a noun. Yeah, curl can be anything. Curl is not a, is a very uh, universal word, right? So therefore, I added a few to other projects just right. since they are at least command line, they're network related. I just wanted to have something to compare with. I'm not judging anything or how, how things have compared over time. And the 100% the here is the maximum attention that any of these then had in this time period. So obviously, in 20, 2004, WGET had more attention on Google than we ever had since then. And, and neither did any of the other projects. They all sort of had less attention on, on Google since then. I'm not sure what that means, but I find it interesting that the, uh, that the current trend is pretty stable. It has just raised a little bit since. Uh, that it says note there, and it's, uh, we changed our algorithms. I don't know. <laughs> it seems to have made some impact on the curl curve, but I don't know. I think it says that um, people are still searching for curl. I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I think it's good. In the meantime, um, since a while back, I don't remember when we started it, we, the um, the core infrastructure initiative at Linux Foundation started this best practices website, how, to, how an open source project should behave to be a good open source project. And I participated a little bit in that work and I submitted curl, so we're, uh, we're available on that URL and we are now 100, well, since already, basically, immediately we're 100% passing, so we have this little, Thing. It's on, on GitHub and it shows somewhere. Yeah, we're, we comply to the best practices. And the project then, you know, this is a project that started from Linux Foundation after Heartbleed basically uh, and the OpenSSL's failure. And people started to realize that we, we have an infrastructure in the world where we use a lot of open source. And how do we know how open source is done? Is it really done good? Should we do anything? So they have this project to measure open source projects, how good we are and, and how, what to fix in, in, in the ecosystem, basically. And when everyone basically can reach 100% this easy, it's, we can raise the bar, or well, they thought so at least, so they added two extra levels. So they added a silver level, which we uh, uh, were 96% compliant. And why are we just 96% silver? Uh, we don't have any legal mechanism for uh, asserting that they are legally authorized to make contributions. That's basically the signed off by thing they do in, in many other projects. It would be easy to also just have a signed off by, <laughs> but, but it is also an extra hassle and I, 
I think we managed fine without signed off by this many years, and apparently nobody has had any problems with that. So. Yeah, yeah, you can just add a dash s to most uh, command lines and do it automatically. But th that's the, yeah, adding it is one part. But if you then you want to make enforce it also, right? So you want to make sure that people actually use that and so on. So mm, I, I'm not sure it's uh, what the value is of saying that we're silver level passing on CII best practices site. I don't think it adds anything. I don't, <laughs> I don't oh, think. It's a pretty complicated thing. You have to get some lawyers to work out on terms if you want to make it legal. Legal means uh, if I contribute to Curl, that my employers also says this is okay. Yes, and but then, but that's up to you, right? That, that's. Um, I just say if, if you want to make it waterproof, this is a real hassle. Yes, I, I, exactly, and that's sort of why I'm sort of hesitating. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to go into this yet. Before someone says this is a really good reason, we should do it because of something, and I haven't really gone there. And then there's the gold level, of course, <laughs> which we are 26% compliant. Uh, so I, one of the requirements for gold is that we are silver. So we, we I didn't really bother. Um, that, that, that's a lot of requirements basically made for much larger projects to, to be able to comply with, so I don't know. Sure, it's a large project, yeah, but I mean larger in amount of people getting paid to do it. Organizations, people with boards and people present all the time. Um, Not that I think we need to go into it, but is there a legal entity? No. Rights and I, I will get back to that because uh, well, I have my presentation later on about governance, and I'll talk about that because there will be eventually, <laughs> any day now. <laughs> so, and, and I, I had this slide last year, and basically everyone uses curl 2019. It's the same. Everyone uses curl uh, as 2018. Um, pretty much all cars, and I had this great, great uh, story about the Volkswagen. 6.5 million farmers, um, but that was a subsidiary to Volkswagen. But anyway, everyone is using it. Uh, nowadays, also I found, figured out that uh, I got an email about my, my excellent game Spider-Man the other day. <laughs> so, so I learned that Spider-Man PS4 is also using curl. Um, Fortnite and Red Dead the Redemption, also big games, a lot of hundreds of millions of installations. So I, I nowadays estimate games alone are more than a half a billion installations of curl. Um, Easier this two dozen, is it? Yes, but but I, I'd like to you I like to have a number. I don't know, get the question a lot, you know, how many users are there of curl? So I, I tend to keep up this list sometimes and just to get the rough estimate to just because it's fun, it makes me happy and people want to know. But usually when I, when I do my estimate number of, of users, I, I say I don't estimate users anymore because what, what's a user? Everyone is using curl. So that's 4 billion internet users. Yeah, sure, 4 billion internet users are using curl, I'm sure. But switching to installations is more is, is easier to count. And then I tend to use all, I tend to count mobile devices as one installation. I put one magnitude up, 60 billion, in terms of things, and, you know, actual individual instances. Yeah, but then I would challenge you to, <laughs> to mention, mention something that, that is running curl in more than 3 billion instances. Uh, mobile devices and iOS devices, I, I estimate 3.5 billion devices. And, and then you go to like Windows 10 machines, 800 million, soon a billion, that's 4.5 billion. Uh, TVs, 400 million, uh, cars, 150 million, but it's hard to come up with devices with larger volumes than that. I mean, does it feel like that from your point of view? Does your inbox just tick away, you know, da -da 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 -da, you know help me, help me, help me, or I've got problems? Or yeah, exactly, yeah, but I, since I don't know about those devices, I can only count those I know about. If someone has told me about it, I found the credit screen somewhere. So sure, there might be some installations like like Steve was telling about the London subway. But still London subway, that's a huge subway. But and even if they have a hundred installations per subway station, 
or a thousand installations. That's, that's not even a million. A million. I mean, we have more printers using curl than the London subway. <laughs> I made this top 10 list about curl uh, users, curl installations, and printers, 50 million installations. It doesn't even come to top 10. Sorry, you can't ask the question. It was great. No, no, it's yeah, fun. Yeah. That's, I, I want to do that. Do you have a sense of uh, what version is most deployed out there? Any kind of like just a, a guesstimate? Is it you know? Is it seven three? You know, what's, what's the bulk of things that are out there? <laughs> yeah, I, th that's a good question. I, I, th what's fun is when I find curl in things. That's usually done by them shipping the license somewhere, you know, in a credit screen or, or in a documentation somewhere. And then there's always the date range, right? So it's copyright on the standby 1998 to 2012 or 2011, 20, 2008. <laughs> so that's usually what I get. So I rarely get the exact version. But so usually people, of course, are using old versions. So everything from 2012 to I would say on this side of 2010 is it usually what people are using, but these days. But of course, they're not using the latest. And usually, in most of these cases, I mean, they have a limited number of servers they connect to. They're possibly often in a closed network in some aspects, and maybe it's not as bad as it would look in the first sight, but usually, of course, quite bad. I still get a lot of questions from people uh, about uh, fixing curl in there. Got a really desperate question from a guy the other day you owning an Opel because he couldn't he couldn't play music on his entertainment system in the car. <laughs> there was something wrong with his Wi-Fi. <laughs> and he had, he had already emailed Opel in uh, one of the, I don't remember which country it was, and, and, and a dealer, and they had it in for service, it didn't work. Said, Can you help me? I found your name in the manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you could really feel the sense of desperation. That I tried everything. I found your name too. Please. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I, I usually I don't reply to them because usually I feel so far away from the user asking. I mean that guy he doesn't understand at all who is who is he contacting and why. So usually I know that just by answering and sort of just open the door to, to more complaints and more questions without the guy knowing anything. But in this case I actually answered and said basically the same thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, my name is there only because of blah blah blah. But he never got back, so I, I don't know. Maybe he just thought I was a loony. And <laughs> Please. Please. Uh, we can fix your problem. Just contact these guys. <laughs> Write out the check and send it here and we will fix it for you. Did you say Wi-Fi? <laughs> So I did a little list of what we did in the project the last 12 months, and it was uh, amazingly big, actually. So I had to split it up of four pages, and I, I don't intend to go into this very deep, but uh, sure, we had a, I made multiplexing by default a while ago, which is fun, since now uh, people are going to do multiplexing in HTTP2 by default without them knowing or trying. Surprisingly few buggy reports on this. We've had a few. Um, I mean, it turned out that some of some of the things in HTTP2 really didn't work as I thought they were or had intended. So, but it hasn't hurt that many users, even if it's better now. And and uh, uh, we also now do the two TLS by default. So, if if you use HTTPS. Uh, uh, HTTP 2 is by default. It tries to negotiate HTTP 2 by default, which is also fun because now it should make an internet where more users are using HTTP 2 multiplexed without anyone actually trying to do anything to do, make it happen. Uh, we, ha we have this fun, uh, you know, the cookie situation, or maybe you don't know the cookie situation, and the cookie situation is always a fun 
we talked about it briefly yesterday, and it's uh, cookies are here. We may discuss replacing it, but we have these different band-aids, and one of the band-aids is the leave secure cookies alone draft, which basically means if you set the secure property on a cookie, only do that if you actually have a secure connection. Uh, finally, we had high resolution timestamps and windows, better than 16 milliseconds. <laughs> we had headers output in bold. I like those sometimes the more user oriented things. Apparently it means a lot to some people. It was surprisingly hard to actually do it because I had to redo a lot of things to split it up like that. Um, and some new features I added, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I added the NASA HTTPS support, which actually was really easy. So it's just internally open, uh, more easy transfers using the multi interface. It's just magically creating, uh, well, internal easy transfers and doing the transfers first and then parse the you know, stuff. Um, Right, and then uh, maybe the biggest thing is the, the introduction of the URL, URL parsing API, finally, uh, and switching the internals to use that parsing API. I have an end of presentation about that, and I'll, I'll describe how it works. Also, we had some glitches, regressions when we were switching to that, but it uh, seems to be pretty good now. Introduce this function, upkeep. I, Yes, basically nobody is using it. It's a method to ask curl to maintain connections alive, even if you're not using any connection. Sorry, that just bumps, I didn't know about that. That just bumps it to keep it open? Yes. When you hit it? When you yes, it. exactly. So you will, you'll just make sure that you know keep pings alive on HTTP2 and so on. Um, since, since if you're not doing that, they will just sit there and nothing will happen and kill everything. Uh, right, and the resolve, the resolve option is supposed to work right now. So it just makes you able to do more fun tricks when connection to sites. And we added support for chunked tra trailer supports in chunked uploads. Very specific. Uh, I guess it's not used that often. But now we support it. I don't know if you've seen that, but Firefox was the first browser to support. Ex uh, trailers in chunked downloads just the other day, actually. Because browsers have never supported uh, trailers in chunked transfers. We support trailers in our implementation. Sorry? We support trailers. Yeah, uh, right, yeah. But uh, that, that's a, for browsers, it's a different matter because they, um, they consider them headers, right? So if, uh, well, they are headers, but they are headers that arrive after the body. So if you consider them just as any other header, you get a security implication when you send them and mix them with other regular headers. So for, for a browser, it's a different situation. They need to make sure that you don't send a, a regular header as a trailer because then you end up. So in Firefox, they whitelist. They only allow one single header in the trailer. <laughs> Server timing colon. So it's only used for that server timing magic. So I guess it's, it's a good thing for them. Old services, so I did, added support for old services just recently. So it's uh, another way. And it was actually also easy to support the, the version, redirect the connect to another host and port instead of the one in the URL. And then we will, of course, use that for it to be three um, later on. <coughs> We can redirect uh, the write out option to standard error. We can uh, support HTTP bearer tokens, which is weird. We changed IMAP to the more RFC correct thing to do when, uh, when specifying a URL. We should do a UID fetch and not a fetch, which of course broke some application, but it made us RFC compliant. You can set an option to do the old way. Added a new TLS backend. We also removed the TLS backend. The, the AX TLS backend we removed. We introduced MesaLink, MesaLink, which, which I think is ironically is claimed to be an OpenSSL, OpenSSL compliant API, but still needed their own files. So I don't know how why you can be API compliant but still not work with our regular uh, OpenSSL files. But still, written entirely in Rust, which seems like a trend these days. 
you can ask for millisecond resolutions. And so we added a lot of fun new uh, setups, curl u, so you can pass in an already parsed URL to curl instead of setting a URL string. With, with the URL API, you might already have the URL parsed. We can set the upload's buffer size, so especially when doing SFTP, it's a good idea to have a really big upload buffer because SFTP is a funny protocol. Uh, it's hard to make it uh, fast with a small upload buffer, while basically all other protocols can have small buffer, uh, upload buffers. Um, right, and TLS 1.3 has different ciphers and cipher names, so we introduced different options to make sure that you can set them separately because you don't know if you're going to get 1.2 or 1.3 or whatever. And we can this allow usernames in, in URLs support for the AX, uh, HA proxy protocol, very basic, simple thing, just adds a little thing before everything else in the request over the proxy. And this is a gem, DNS shuffle addresses, because you can't do round robin with DNS, we can do it ourselves instead. Just shuffle them around so that you get the round robin connection or, or a random, pick a random address out of the responses you get. And there are two new ones for alt uh, services too. You mentioned that Daniel, uh, buffer size. Is there a proxy up in other projects for a while now? Is there a buffer size or any kind of... Uh, yeah, but that already existed. So, so yes, so there's a download buffer size as well. And um, these days the curl tool sets both, it sets a download size at least to 100k. And Well, it's not, right, because default is still 16K. Uh, so a, a regular libcurl using app that didn't change anything would still use 16K. So, so I don't think it's that. And I, I changed the buffer size only because I did some performance testing, just downloading insanely much data from local host mm -hmm. or something that is very, very close and really, really fast. And then it makes a little difference by... Then I think I could actually basically double the speed by increasing the buffer size. In most cases, 16K is pr perfectly fine unless you're sort of doing localhost transfers. And I'm, I'm not sure we need to optimize for localhost transfers. Uh, right, everything curl. If you want a book, Dan has a book or two. He has the physical version. Um, 70K words, 10K lines. We're still uh, uh, improving it. Yes, 332 pages in the PDF version. And the book isn't, it's slightly less. But that's not, it's not based on the PDF version. It's based on the on a, on Dan's magic version. Pages. Sorry, what? 248. 248 pages. Right, and that's the 2018 edition. So it's actually, the online version is, is a little extended. The book is 95.1% complete because. <laughs> yeah, very. <laughs> How would you know that? <laughs> How do you know when it's not written? No, <laughs> no but I, I, just, I just made a script so that I've added sections for everything I want into the book, and I just. When the, the sections that don't have any text, so I, I know how many sections are still missing, and I just estimate. The, the number of text for the, uh, well, the amount of text written already and the number of sections missing. So we could just, yeah, that makes it about this. And I can estimate that we're missing, uh, I think it's about 5,000 words or whatever it is. But I'm sure that we will add new sections and more contents over time. So I'm not sure that we will ever reach more than 95% complete. <laughs> it, it'll be a struggle because, I mean, since the last time I uh, updated the book, I think we've added a bunch of features that aren't mentioned in the book. So the, the book should probably have get more sections. So the, the completeness level should rather go down short term until we get more content to up it again. Yeah, and you can read it all online on ec.hacks.se. Or you can actually nowadays order one of these books from that URL. And that's what the, the alibris.co.uk site. Then you can get one of those in the mail instead of getting it from the hands I have to carry it home again.
No. <laughs> save him, save him. Okay, what is less good in a project still then? Uh, well, we have pretty flaky tests and CA systems. Um, I'm not sure who to blame for this. I think our tests might not be the, uh, the ideal, but our, our friends at AppVayer and Travis are not uh, the most stable friends. They're sort of, they go up and down a little bit. So it's really hard. These days, getting the tests all green is usually not only a matter of your own effort, you also have to retry a few tests a few times until they actually turn up green because they just failed and timed out and did stupid things before, which is highly annoying. Especially for newcomers who aren't really aware of that, so they submit a fine little patch and then just get some stupid app layer problems. And app layer tends to almost always fail, so I have to rerun them at least once. And then they succeed. And they're going slower and slower, and I think we're, we're going to run into problems with the slow, uh, slow CI test because uh, Travis has a maximum time of 50 minutes, I think, per run, and we're going to run into this problem more. I, I mean, that graph with number more tests, 1,250 tests going further, and more tests, more slower tests, we are going to run into the time limit more and more often. Um, I think we see them now just when Travis are having problem mostly, so that it's slower than usually, is, and then, then we get into 50 minutes, but soon it'll be more our fault and less their fault. So uh, it would be good, I don't know what to do about it, make the test faster. Right, we still get vulnerabilities re reported, we still do regressions, it's, it's really hard to keep everything stable, but it would be fun to do less regressions, but I don't know really what the answer is to that. More tests, yeah. So I just wanted to say something about the future as well. So as usual, I don't, I don't plan much ahead. I can't tell anyone what anyone wanted, should do or want to do, but I have some ideas what I want to do. And I don't plan much ahead. I have ideas what I want to do in the project and it'll change basically <laughs> any day if something fun shows up. And now when I'm going to try to work at, uh, with Curl for Wolf SSL, I will of course also sort of be pretty happy to switch focus if someone has uh, uh, given me money to switch focus. <laughs> uh, and I also wanted to say, the future then going forward, there's, I like to discuss the ability of um, a version eight in the future. And just, and I don't want a version eight for other reasons than we do release every fifty six days, right? We're releasing seven point sixty five to zero because I want to do things in the next release. It's going to be an added bumped minor number, and uh, if we do this every eight weeks, <laughs> we have nineteen hundred days until we hit seven point one hundred. And I really don't want to hit 7.100 because I think it's going to cause confusion to go from 99 to 100 because it's going to be too similar to either 7.1 or 7.10 or, or something like that. So I think we should have a version 8 before we <laughs> hit 7.100. So, um, five years and 4.5 months. So we have until September 2024 to come up with a reason to bump to version 8. <laughs> I, I, I'm not actually suggesting that we need a particularly good reason. We can just bump it whenever, but at least it's something. Yes, but we, we should get rid of legacy crap. But as I will mention in my other presentation, we should do that anyway without this bump. So I'm actually thinking we should rather just at some point in time just bump it without any particular fanfares or, or fireworks and just do it Linux kernel style. When we run out of numbers, we just start, out, start over on the next one. Not, not only that, but we've also previously, years ago, discussed um, changing some of the API. Yes, we have. And, and we have in the to-do a lot of suggestions what we could do when we bump version number. But mm -hmm. is that a clever thing to do? We, we come back to this, people mm -hmm. will haunt yeah, us. Yeah, with, yeah. They will chase us with pitchforks if we do that. So yeah, it, it, we, we should really sort of is it worth it? Do we really get enough value out of 
removing and changing those things? That, that's just what I'm asking. I don't have, have the answers really. And the only thing one I can think of, I don't know way around it, it might have been sold over the last few years, but on Windows 64 bit, a socket is not a long. Mm. So if you want the socket descriptor on 64 bit Windows, but we have already fixed that. So, yes, but, but we, and, I mean, for most of these things, we can just introduce something new that fixes the problem and just say, don't use the old thing. So that's the way to sort of live with it and just fix it for the new ones. And, and usually that is okay. But of course, it adds code, so we could clean up the old crap if we would break the ABI or end an, the API. But is it worth it? Do we need it? Do we want to? I don't know. I, you could argue people have now got from today five years of 4.5 months to prepare themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it works <laughs> like that. As a, just as a, from a feature level, you know, just have that as your crossover. It's going to happen within five years, I think. Probably two years. Stable something. Yes, I could. We could have, but yeah, but yeah, sure. At some point, say that it's now. Yeah, sure. And, and then do it more like, yeah, we just bump it one day. Now we have this support and we call it version 8. Sure. Would be, would be one way. Did you think about it as a stable version? For example, uh, say version 7 becomes stable, you just make bug fixes, and version 8 has something more. I, uh, yes, and, and people ask for that sometimes, but I. I I don't think, I think that only adds work for us without uh, sufficient sort of upside. I don't think we gain much by it. I think we risk tricking ourselves into making it harder by backporting, things. Yeah, by backporting and suddenly, no, this isn't stable, you can do whatever you want and then we have uh, sort of a crazy situation there and the stable there. And what do, no, I, I rather like that we have one, we only have one branch here, so people will use that or they will not want to use that. So the, it's easier for people, it's easier to get people to just run the dev version if you want to be on the bleeding edge. There's nothing in non particular branches. So I think it, I like the way we do it and I don't, I don't feel a strong reason to change it. I mean, of course, if someone wants to maintain a, a stable branch for the long term, someone could. It, it would be easy to just Sure, someone could just sit on, the, on an older branch and just merge bug fixes or security fixes and, and keep that alive, but I don't, think, I don't think that is how our users work mostly. People tend to either just sit on a fixed version for a very long time and then upgrade after 10 years. <laughs> so I upgraded from this version. It doesn't work. You know, something broke. Yeah, it amplifies everything. And as, a, and, as, and as a parallel, I also got the question about should we host documentation for other versions than current Git master? Because right now, when we commit a change to documentation, it appears on the site within minutes, right? So if we fix something, we add something to the in Git master, it shows up in the documentation. And maybe we haven't even released the fix yet, but it shows up in the documentation on, on the site. Maybe we should have, you know, a lot of projects have look at the documentation for version blah 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 and but that also makes it more complicated and I w I'd, I'd rather have us emphasize the documentation f since our documentation is really covering an API that has been around for 20 years in, in the longest case we should rather just emphasize for which version things work in the documentation so that the same because it's supposed to be there anyway for long term Everything has a release time, so you could build documentation. Yeah, you can still do it if you want to have. If you want to check out the old docs, you can do that. Sure, it's easy. So back to the stable branch, maybe we can convince Yeah, he said to me that he needed more work. <laughs> So what I feel uh, I'm going to consider for libcurve work going forward this year or maybe next year or whatever 
First, I want to, of course, always keep up with browsers. Browsers always come up with new fun things, and I'm going to participate in the HTTP workshop next week and discuss more fun things that we are going to do with HTTP and thing, you know, should we fix cookies and set, uh, in, invent a new things, which, which all of these new things, you know, they never actually remove the old thing. It just adds a new thing, and we have more stuff to deal with. So there's going to be more stuff over time. So there's going to be HTTP 3 and quick going forward. I want to get uh, working on the ESNI, which is the encrypted SNI. Uh, there's, uh, I think there's an updated draft just recently on how to do that. Since SNI now is basically the only way your ISP can snoop on your traffic and know who you're talking to. Since it's in clear text in, a, in TLS, so you can still see that even in quick. But with ESNI you can uh, encrypt that and it will become much harder because you can still see the destination IP address but nowadays especially with CDNs everywhere the destination IP address is a very bad hint on who you're actually talking to or what site you're visiting. In many cases uh, there are of course exceptions. If you go to a, single, a site on a single IP you know oh, still but we can't do much about that. I'm, I'm going to consider doing code for hard coding localhost, which is also another draft. And uh, I mean, that's an old thing. Windows, I believe, hard code localhost since a long time ago. When if you if you actually uh, get host you know, get other info on localhost, you actually get the fixed code back. It doesn't really resolve it. It doesn't use the HTTP host file or whatever. It, you get a fixed thing back. Uh, and there's a there's a draft for that. There's a security related thing because in resolving local host of a DNS, it might, very few people actually want that, but you can easily end up doing that. So someone can trick you to do silly things. Maybe a uh, uh, long-standing thing, refuse redirect redirections from HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, from HTTP to HTTPS, that's the way You're right. <laughs> It is. Uh, it, was uh, it was a test, and you and you, and you made it. <laughs> you succeeded. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know this arrows the hard hard things. You know in which direction they should go. And uh, I also have the you know this long-standing thing that I tend to fill up my time with arguing with people using capital X on command lines with curl since they then you know with capital X you set a another method with curl the command line and if you then follow a redirect it'll send the same again while the redirect can actually tell curl to change the method you know should you change the method or not in a redirect the redirect response code tells us what to do but you can override that by setting this custom request and we will always use that custom request which is rarely what users expect so users using this they will always get upset and, and think uh, curl is misbehaving while we're actually acting exactly as documented and since a long time but I'm considering <coughs> adding a way to tell us to use use custom request only on the first request if we follow a redirect follow the redirect rules which happens to be what most users seem to think this function <laughs> this option does while well, it doesn't HSTS along we have a patch already maybe it's time to get it done and merged using the library from Tim. And uh, I'm considering a way uh, to do some sort of better way to, to make a build where you can toggle features on and off in, in libcurl. Right now it's really difficult to um, tweak what, what, if you want to build your custom libcurl you just want to have these particular features enabled and not the others. How do you do that and how do you make sure that it's fairly complicated and obscure and undocumented? So I'm considering doing something about it. And then we got this fun, interesting suggestion the other day about maybe we should introduce <coughs> the config file reading support uh, as an API. I don't think it really is a libcurl thing. Maybe we should have a separate library for that. Maybe not. The option is now just part of curl tool? Yes. Yeah. The idea is to hide that off into its own thing. Yes, in that case. Yes. Right, exactly. So that other uh, 
tools or applications that want to offer the same sort of options can just use the library instead. I'm a little bit scared about the, uh, the, the new, we need to make sure that we use correct words and, and not all options are going to be libcurl specific. Some of them are really just for the curl tool, you know, other, so it's, it might sound easy to start with. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of edge cases and, and fiddly stuff. It's interesting when you talk, I can't remember when, but the idea of um, profiles, Setting the curl to reflect common you know, workloads or common scenarios. And yes. Or, or building up a, you know, you could ship curl with a couple of configurations that are common. Uh, I'm wondering if, if we do that first before we do you know, that. Yeah. Well, uh, th this is more of an idea that has been brought. I, as many other ideas, I think ideas are fun. Sure, bring ideas, but I'd rather have someone have a strong desire to actually see this in use in an application and work on it before I spend much time. As, as this far, I think, is a fun idea. But if nobody's going to work on it, I don't think I'm going to work on it either. Just it will remain a fun idea until someone actually has a really good use case for it and, and wanna, I'm going to make sure that it happens. You have a config file already where you can put, uh, well, for example, options, command line options or something. Yes. So you can specify the file. Yes. So that's it. Yeah, okay. yeah but that's in, the, that's in the tool and not in the okay. library. So that's, that's where it comes from. So they would rather want it moved from the tool into library so that other applications could use the parsing ability. So, so the curl ops would be serialized. Basically, yes. So we're not talking about the, the curl tool configurations, which roughly mirror the curl ops. Yeah, ba mostly, yes. yes. The curl ops internally, when you set them all, it's just a big struct. More or less, yes. So it's, it's, it's not that complicated. What makes, uh, yeah, it's not that complicated. It's rather complicated that we have to agree on an API. You have to agree on how it should be used. You have to package it. It's, a it's, not, it's also for controlling the curl. It's only part of the, only solves part of the uh, configuration, not the entire configuration. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And then um, it'll only be, exactly. It, so it it's not, wants. You know, as worth as, you know, getting configured. <coughs> Right, and then uh, app applications using this, they will use their own file names somewhere. I, I mean, how is this going to be a benefit to the users? I don't know, because it's... And it's not that we have had a lot of users asking for it, I mean, authors asking for it either. So, I mean, we've been around for 20 years, and now people are suggesting this idea. So it's, I don't know. But I think it's an interesting idea. I'm not just sure to do with it. Yeah, I agree, and that goes back a little bit to my idea about setting, uh, allowing libcurl to sort of support some environment variable, for example, that would allow me to deny some things. So if an application uses libcurl, but I don't want to let it do clear text HTTP. So I could say, no way you're allowed to do it clear text HTTP in an environment variable, and libcurl will read it and refuse clear text HTTP even if the application would otherwise do it. So it would fail, because I, I want to up the security level for my application using libcurl. I would sort of 
go, come up to this level or fail. So you're saying dynamically you would assert the build time features as enabled disabled. So I'm sorry, we're talking about implementation now, but it, it, you're saying there are build time there are build time features that you want to dynamically disable or enable. Yes, or I mean that was the, exactly that was my idea. So, yes. so if you if you build with all features. Um, uh, Want to be able to say no. Basically, the basic is like this. If, if you're building an application today, for example, it might be fine, but 10 years down the line, you might have changed your mind about your security setup. You want to make sure that whatever is in your system that is using libcurl should at least use some Cypher, some TLS version, some HP version, some uh, switch off, switch on, things like that. And you would say, no application on my system that uses libcurl should ever be allowed to do these bad things, they should only do these good things. And then libcurl itself would make sure that it followed your instructions rather than instructions in the application. That was my idea, but uh, uh, as uh, when I discussed it on the mailing list, quite a lot of people would say, no, no, we would disable that in libcurl. We don't want the users to be, and it's, it's not, uh, so, sorry, just a second. So I, I think it's also fair to say, because then me as a user introduces problems in the applications, so I will get errors, so how would they handle that? So that when I report a problem to the, it's, it's actually my fault, rather not, not the application, right? So. Well, this is the danger here, like a, some sort of roles-based access control mechanism. The, the question right after you implement this is, uh, I want some users to be able to use this feature and some users not to be able to use this feature. <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's yeah, the uh, Yes, I agree. So I guess we're on the downhill no, from I mean, that. The right so. answer, the righteous answer, would be build the curl you want with the right compile time option. That would be the righteous. Yes, and, but it also started out like this, you know, a lot of scripts use curl, right? A lot of scripts use dash k in them, which is, is a horrible way. Yeah, they ship the script and they just refuse to check your HPS connections. And that's basically saying that we don't care about it. And do you want to run those scripts? Maybe we could help you find those problems in those scripts by having a way to do that. You know, beep, you should just fail. Whoop, my curl command line tried to use an option that I uh, refused it to use. It's, it, and that's how I started. Well, why stop at shell scripts? Why? I mean, these uh, switching off verification of servers, that's a common thing, right? People do that they shouldn't, and they deploy it in production, and they really shouldn't. How do you detect that as a user? Really hard. It would be nice if you could just say, I, my applications should never run without verify the cert. There's no way to extract the information that is. We only have setters, no getters. Why do I think I've done this problem and solved it by getting options that were set previously? I told game to structs. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I mean, the information is there. Yes, so it's, it's of incorrect. course. It's not yeah. very fun to do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I think so, what you're proposing is some nice get. Yeah, exactly. Like a get opt that would. Do the opposite of set up. So yeah. You could define that it's only read only, so you would just give the inner pointer. Assuming that the data is kept that way by curl, right? So some yeah, well, of option may be actually be able to be created, but for something like a list or a string or integer. 
Yeah, most of them are easily just exported. So yeah, we, that's certainly possible. And for things to do in curl, I, I ended up looking at the list that I made last year, and it's, I couldn't think of anything else. It's the same list, basically. There are a lot of things we can improve in the curl tool. Mm. Pretty, um, they're not easily fixed. Push, maybe, isn't that complicated to fix if I wanted to, but is I don't think there's a strong need to support push in the tool. I want to do parallel transfers, but parallel transfers is a bit uh, hairy. So I, I have a, I've started the work somewhere, but I need to change so the API, so that it uses the multi-API instead of the easy API for the tool. So it would rather collect all transfers first and then do them all at once, if asked to, rather than serially. So, yeah, a bit. So are we talking uh, Different protocols in parallel? No, yes, all protocols, whatever protocols, all in parallel. Instead of doing them serially, as it now, right? If you if you enter curl now, you run one, two, three, four, five. It'll do them one, two, three, and one until done, two until done, three until done. And why do that? Usually these days you can do them all five at once if they're independent from each other. Just get them all. Right. Okay. So I, I can use FTP. Exactly, yeah, all of this, and an unlimited number from unlimited protocols wherever, get everything at once. And uh, as long as they're in independent, you could do that all at once, but of course a lot of scripts are going to use, I want to get that script, that file first, and then that one, so I can't, we couldn't enable it by default in parallel, but we could have some options that says do them in parallel if you want to. So I'll send you a note and, and talk as well, but you know, we, uh, we have in, in Wolf SSL, we did the asynchronous I.O. Um, so we could pair up with TLS. So you may be able to borrow that code. Yeah, but we already do this. So, so it's not, it's, for us, this is not a question about how we do TLS at all. This is just a matter, we already support all this in, in libcurl. So this is just a matter of, of uh, uh, remodeling the curl tool to use the, the libcurl the right way. No, I understand. The, 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 the code I'm talking about in, in uh, Wolf SSL's <coughs> async code can be used independently of TLS. So it could potentially be that, um, uh, that kind of an I.O. layer. It's an it's a abstract I.O. layer that could be used for, for this. I don't know how far you, how long you are either, so it may not make sense. But no, I don't, I don't think, I mean, for, because all of that is already covered. We already have all that. This is just a matter of, of uh, how we are going to use all what we have in a different way from, I mean, I'm not saying that, that it can't be productive anyway, but I, it's, this is, the problem here is just that we need to change how we're using libcurl from the tool side, if we want to do it. I want to do it, but it's... Uh, so the curl side, the curl tool side, is sort of the bash side. And so why not just fork, you know, curl? Well, fork it because you don't, don't, you don't get a control. You know, I mean, if you want to do 200 files at the same time, you don't want to fork for each because, uh, sure, you can do that. But, but it's going to be more inconvenient. And I, I would rather go with a way so that people who already have, you know, I have a script that downloads 43 URLs in a curl command line. Maybe if I introduce this, I can just, those scripts can just magically, instead, so you just add an option. So the URL list still happens sequentially? Yeah, the, by default, they would still be sequentially because yes, I wouldn't yeah. dare to change that because then things will break. But imagine just adding a little option that says, get them all at once instead of okay. serially. So parallel transfers isn't about multiple invocations of curl. And having a master, uh, you know, uh, having a curl master, uh, not curl, I'm sorry, uh, uh, curl master sort of taking, you know, some state between each invocation. No, that, that is one, of, that's, a, that's a separate sorry, thing, I think. Be because I, th having the master slave is more, uh, that's more if you, while doing transfers, you come up with, oh, I want to download another file from, maybe from one of the same 
host that you're already transferring, then you want to have the master doing the transfers and start to slave say, well, add another transfer to my already ongoing transfers. Or, or just maybe have the master process always stuck in the background. You know, it doesn't do anything. So, so it, can, it can maintain connections and so on alive. So if you want to do another transfer right now, you send that from the slave to the master and it has a connection pool with it. So you get transfer done as if it was a normal command line. Well, that's why we get more connections to the HTTP version. <laughs> uh, and parallel transfers will be difficult cross-platform, presumably. Uh, not difficult, but a challenge to... No. It'll be easy. We already solved the problems. Oh, right. So, uh, no. It'll work perfectly. I think if it will be problematic if we want to go with the socket uh, action API. If we want to scale really good upwards, I mean, I mean beyond 100, maybe thousands of parallel. Because then we want to go event-based, and event-based becomes a problem. Uh, I mean, portability-wise. So what, what's the use case? The, well, the, the use case for parallel transfers. It just to get the, uh, because if a lot of transfers are made serially that could basically then just complete faster if you do them all at once instead of one by one. Mm -hmm. Is it usually um, one to one as opposed to one to n that people are thinking about? I, I'm not sure. I would imagine that we also have a lot of use cases when people are actually you know using a range, so you get you use this is the, from this host. I will. I want to get all comic images, comic zero to one hundred dot jpg, so jpg. So I can just get these hundred images, and I could just parallel, parallelize, parallelize that, and get them all at once from the same host. Especially if you're using HTTP two or something, it's still the same connection. You just do hundred streams of the same connection. So it would make things much faster for some use cases. In, um, I know that uh, uh, there's this uh, curl competitor called Ac what's it called Tatsuhiro's thing. Um, I don't remember right now, but it's uh, also using multiple connections to download parts of the same file, so you could actually, you know, download. Ranges, uh, yeah, exactly. Just yeah, using ranges and download the same thing from multiple connections, which is. Uh, it's a bit of an ugly thing, but it, to many users, that's that's a much faster download. Which is debatable if we should participate in, but it's still one way to accelerate downloads at times. I mean, do we have a sense of just raw speed today in terms of um, how much optimization? I mean, it is pretty optimized. From my it opinion. is pretty optimized. And I, I, I sometimes I run, I have a little script that counts mallocs per download. So I have this four gigabyte thing I download a very local host just to, to make sure that we don't accidentally insert like mallocs in the, in the main transfer path. So that, um, you know, f four gigabytes shouldn't suddenly use hundreds or thousands of mallocs, then we're doing something wrong. So nowadays we're at, I think we're at 72 mallocs for one of these plain HTTP transfers, and that's basically setting up and uh, a lot of tiny things in the beginning, and then we just run. So, but it's hard. How do you compare tr uh, transfer performance? I, I tend to do that download from a local host as fast as I can with an SSD and see how fast it gets. And it gets really fast, but what is fast? Is it faster than the, on, on the operating system? What's the equivalent? Right. What's the fastest? Well, and uh, really, what is fast here? I mean, fast isn't just fast. Fast has to be taken to, I mean, what, how do you get that speed? I mean, by implementing it yourself, the most optimized way for yeah. your optimized yeah. application, you could do it probably faster. But there's a benefit to using a standard API that you know and use and are familiar with, and you can read online how it works and so on. So that's. And then there's, okay, how fast are you when you're doing 10,000 parallel connections or doing 100 streams over HTTP2? There are a lot of factors. I, I, I mean, I don't have a sense that the questions, well, the, the, you know, 
know, the past year's bug fixes, what, you know, what percentage are performance related? You know, or, or, you know, this is too slow, kind of. I very rarely get bug reports on this is too slow. Mm. They're they tend to be more like uh, this looks, uh, I mean, th this takes more time than it should be. Some, somehow the timeout doesn't trigger here now. So, we, so of, course I've, of course we've fixed performance problems. We would do that all the time because, um, but, so yeah, we're getting faster, we're getting better. But then how, how do we compare what is fast, what is good? I, I don't have any... In most cases, we don't have any you know, sort of real competitor compare us to this. They could do it this fast. We can only do it this fast. <coughs> yeah, for, for some setups you can do that, but for many others you can't do yeah, that. Okay, so yeah, I agree that yeah, if, you have an, if you have a tool that... But then it also becomes a weird case because sometimes when, like the other day, uh, the user who discussed um, performance in curl, he compared with H2 load and, and comparing download speed with H2 load. That's really hard to compare with. It's re really a raw download, sort of made specifically for downloading as fast as possible. So it's really hard to compare with. So of course that'll be faster. And then the question is, how much slower is still fast enough or how much slower is too slow? Yeah, how much resources are being used Right, and I mean, we don't we don't write a library for load testing. We actually make it for for a library for transfers with an API that you want to use. But then in the end, we were faster than, anyway than the AB benchmark tool, which is made for load testing and benchmarking Apache. So it's, it's still fast enough for many cases. But my experience is everything else I write is slower than Perl. <laughs> but there's another there's another that's you know slowing things down always in, in Chrome. Right, and that's usually I mean the network is usually the slowest part anyway. So it is rarely that you actually end up with curl being the bottleneck. But I'm sure that it still is. And I, I'm sure that for, for example I think HP2 might be a problematic area. I'm just guessing here because HP2 is compl is complicated with all those streams. Our API and all those streams, how do you deliver what data to what callback and so on? I think it might not be the fastest. But I think we're doing pretty good. And I'd like to compare, uh, you know, since, uh, you know, there's this um, command line tool called HTTPy. Yeah. Like curl, but for humans, or what it's called. They have that sort of fun slogan, sort of poking us in the eye. And, I, and, I, and I, I've enjoyed running performance tests with that and comparing with curl. And that is a fun thing to do, <laughs> because curl sort of, that's a Python tool. Curl sort of runs in circles around that tool. <laughs> I think on my machine, I think curl is eight times faster from localhost which is a ridiculous difference. But that tool is not made for doing fast transfers at all. It's made for something else. But we've written tools that are faster than Pro do very, very constrained things. Yeah, exactly. And that, I think you can always do that. And I, think, I don't think that is an area we can, should, or even, I mean, attempt to compete with. Of course you can do a special purpose thing that is faster than Pro, I'm sure. It would be weird otherwise. And you know, many times also it come down, comes down to particular platforms. And when, since we write a, a portable tool and library, it's made generically for a generic platform, right? So if you have special knowledge about your particular platform, a particular setup, you can optimize for that as well. Zero copy uh, buffer interface can be used for a long time. Right, zero, zero copy. But, but zero copy, I, I mean, that tends to also be the sort of holy grail about doing network transfers. It's the copying part is rarely, I mean, again, net, the network is so slow usually, so the copying part is rarely notable when you do things. So you really have to be a special condition when, when the zero copy actually adds a lot to, to the equation or removes a lot, perhaps. So it really takes a lot of measurement 
to actually be sure that the zero copy is worth all the troubles because it's complicated to add a zero copy interface, especially to some sort of transfer protocols and stuff because you, you don't want the raw data, you want the payload and the payload is in a weird format sometimes. So it's hard to do zero copy, but okay, you can avoid the copying from the callback. You could have an API that you provide buffers ahead of time, maybe. Doesn't the Linux kernel support direct socket uh, file structure problem within the kernel? Read file. Yeah, read yeah, but, file. Yeah, but, they, <laughs> but it still doesn't work right because everything is TLS anyway. So, yeah, so everything is TLS compressed and, uh, in, in, and yeah. chunked and coded. And <laughs> so you still sort of have to fiddle out all the bytes. So I think, I think the, the major copying part is with libcurl is that we deliver the data in a callback so you get a pointer to our buffers so you need to move that data. So if, if the application would instead provide a data buffer first, we could fill it up and, and ask for a new data buffer. But it's complicated to write a, an application that way too, to provide data buffers because then mm, how do you do that? Yeah. Could be worth it. You, I, I guess you can improve your performance in an application in, in some cases with that at least. But why do it if nobody needs it? Sorry? Why do it if nobody needs it? Right, exactly. So, so I'm, if someone identifies the copying to be a bottleneck, then I think, then I'm ready to discuss it. Or if somebody says six billion installations, uh, everybody causes Right, right. But then, then the question is, yeah, yeah, sure. And then we add it tomorrow, right? And it'll take 12 years until we update anyway. So they will spend 12 years of CPU cycle anyway. <laughs> I'm done. Sponsors. <laughs>